Like Mike said, I'm Brad Nelson, uh, <clears throat> uh, CFO, also VP finance and technology. Technology is actually my background. Um, I started in uh, software development for the, for Beaten Bow Homes many, many years ago. And it's actually kind of funny. Uh, this gentleman over here was asking me how many times I've done this. And, and the answer is actually just once. So this is it actually. <laughs> Uh, public benefit corporations are actually such a new thing in the world um, that there aren't that many experts on them. <clears throat> and so today you get me. Uh, are there any lawyers in the room? Lawyers? Cool, so I can say whatever I want and nobody will know the difference. Um, any business owners though? Any? So we got some business owners in the room. And so for the business owners in the room, I wanna take a quick poll. How many of you think that your business exists for something other than just profitability, other than just making money? So we have some people in the room who have businesses who, who exist for purposes beyond profit. And so that, that's really what we're kind of getting into today is, is this realm, uh, and this is a, isn't really like a recent thing. Obviously, uh, it's, it's been around for a long time, but this has become kind of a bigger, bigger thing as people learn that having a purpose beyond profit is actually actually drives your profit. There are a lot of things about that that are not only just attractive to employees, um, but attractive to investors as well. And actually when you look at it, we had a, a PhD business researcher come talk to us the other day, and he was telling us that uh, businesses that have a purpose beyond profit actually perform better financially than businesses that just exist for profit. And that shouldn't be surprising because money is not exactly a great motivator, is it? Um, when you pay somebody money to do something, uh, really what they're not, they're not just seeing the money behind your payment, what they're seeing is the potential that that money has to fulfill their own personal purposes. And the more you can align the purpose of your business with the purposes of your employees, their own personal purposes, uh, the more magic is gonna happen in your own business. So, that being said, I wanna take a step here and talk about some corporate law. So this is gonna give you kind of some background on why public benefit corporations are such an important thing. And in corporate law, so everyone knows what corporations are, uh, corporate decisions have to be justified using shareholder value. So whenever we make a decision as a corporation, really we have to be doing, making that decision in terms of the best interest of the shareholders. So really what we're supposed to be doing is making money for the shareholders. And that's, that, that's actually a law. I can't get around that. Uh, directors, officers are all bound to act in the best interest of shareholders. Um, if we don't, the shareholders can actually come sue me. So me as a CFO, if I make a decision that's uh, counter to the interest of the shareholders of, of our company, uh, and not being a public benefit corporation, uh, they can actually come in and sue me and say, you know, you gave a bunch of money away that one year, you gave 82%, that's not really, that doesn't make sense um, in, in, in business terms, so I'm gonna sue you and kick you out of the company and maybe hold you personally li liable for uh, what you just did. And so that's actually, uh, a lot of people don't know that about corporations, but that's actually true. Uh, your shareholders can sue you. And so, but that's an interesting thing because a lot of companies nowadays and a lot of entrepreneurs and uh, even investors are starting to see this, uh, is this idea of social responsibility in your own business. Uh, you look at a, maybe like a Tom's Shoes, and I'm not saying Tom's Shoes is perfect, but uh, you think about Tom and it's actually funny, he and I went to the same high school. Um, he didn't set out with this idea that I'm just gonna give, I'm gonna take all this money that I have and buy a bunch of shoes and just give them away. He said, I'm gonna take all this money I have, start a business, and now I have this economic engine that's just continuously generating shoes that I can give away. And that's a really cool idea. And so this idea of social responsibility in business has really taken off. However, there's some problems. And that is, so in, in the Tom's Shoe case, I wanna, I wanna have a corporation and I wanna have shareholders. I don't wanna just always own this myself. I wanna go public maybe at some point or, uh, something like that, but how do I have this social responsibility on the one hand, where I wanna do all these great things for society, for the public, um, for the beneficiaries of this company, but I also have to legally balance profit with it because corporate law says that, well, you have to act in the best interest of the shareholder. And so how do, like I've got this problem now, I, I wanna give shoes away, but now I have to make a lot of money at the same time, and if those ever come into, or go out of balance, then my shareholders might come sue me. And that's a pretty significant problem. Um, 
you know, my liability as, a, as an officer or director is, is a serious problem there too, but the, you know, the other problem that you have in a social enterprise is mission drift. And that's the problem where uh, I started out, you know, maybe I'm Tom Shoes, maybe I'm Beaten Bohomes. We started out with this idea that we're gonna um, really care for people and uh, I'm not getting into this purpose of Beaten Bohomes just yet, but uh, let's go back to Tom Shoes. I'm gonna give a lot of shoes away. How do I ensure that the future, after I'm gone, how do I ensure that the future directors, the future shareholders and the future officers are all bound by that same social purpose? That they can't just decide, eh, that was nice then, but this is now and we're gonna make money again. And we're gonna go back to just focusing on profit. So enter public benefit corporations. The first uh, public benefit corporations were in Maryland in 2010. So this is actually only, this has been around for less than a decade. This is very new stuff. And um, what it is, is it's an election by a regular corporation. So any corporation can elect this, in, in, assuming you're in a state that has it. Um, and what you do is you have a public benefit statement. So you, you have a statement that says, these are the people that I want to benefit, and this is the benefit that I want to give them. And so, and as we'll talk about in a minute, this, these can actually be a lot of different benefits. Uh, and in Texas, it's very broad. Um, but you also, in addition to the public benefit statement, you have to actually back up that you're gonna do that with a public benefit report uh, that's issued regularly. In Texas, it's biennial. Uh, in other states, it's annual. It just kind of depends on the jurisdiction that you're in. And what this allows you to do is when you make that election and you have a public benefit statement and you produce a benefit report, now the corporation and its officers and its directors can now balance profit with this other public benefit. And they can also balance that with the impact that that corporation has on the people that it just interacts with in daily life. And so that's a really cool thing. So now, uh, if I started a shoe company and I wanna give lots of shoes away, now I can say, because I wanna help people not be barefoot um, and avoid the diseases that you get when you're barefoot, I can now balance that with this also need to make money. Whereas before, if I wanted to heal people's bare feet, I had to either be a nonprofit and, and do that on a nonprofit basis, and therefore I could do whatever I wanted to from a social benefit standpoint, but then I couldn't make a profit because the IRS won't let me, or I had to just focus on profit and only profit and own the entire corporation myself so that I'm the only shareholder and I'm not really gonna sue myself, and so, uh, but I'll never take on investors and I'll never take on, uh, I'll never be able to go public. Uh, I'll just be stuck with what I am. So that's a really cool thing. So a lot of people have kind of heard a couple terms here and I wanna, I wanna kind of dispel a couple myths. Uh, a lot of people have heard of what's called a certified B Corp. Has anybody ever heard of that? Anybody ever think certified B Corp and PBC was the same thing? I, I did at one point. Um, Certified B Corps are different. They're not necessarily the same thing. Actually, a lot of PBCs are also certified B Corps and a lot of certified B Corps are also PBCs, but not necessarily. Uh, certified B Corp is really like a certification, like LEED certified or um, you know, certified humane anim animals. We're in the farming business, so <laughs> we, but that's all really certified B Corp means. It's not a legal, def it's not a legal status. It's being a certified B Corp doesn't, grant your officers and directors uh, immunity from any uh, shareholder lawsuits. It's merely, uh, yeah, it's merely a marketing thing. Uh, it doesn't protect you against mission drift because the officers can just decide to stop doing it at any point. But it does provide assurance to your customers as a marketing benefit that you're res operating your business in a responsible way. Um, and so a lot of public benefit corporations have chosen to become B Corps as well. Uh, we have not um, for, for a few limited reasons, but uh, some example public benefit corporations, Patagonia, Method, King Arthur Flower, Kickstarter is actually a public benefit corporation. Um, a lot of companies are really starting to latch onto this idea, especially if they have uh, a public benefit and they have a purpose beyond profit. They're really starting to get into this. Um, and especially if you're in the public space, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big deal for investors nowadays. A lot of people are looking to invest in socially responsible businesses uh, that have a public benefit. And so that's a, that's a good thing. PBC in Texas, let's talk about that. PBC in Texas is actually only, it's less than a year old at this point. 
Uh, the first PPCs in Texas could have only started less than a year ago on September 1st of 2017. And that was passed by the pre prior legislative session. Uh, this requires an election in your artis articles of incorporation to take advantage of it. So um, those of you who, are from, who have started a corporation, you know you have articles of incorporation. Uh, what you do is, uh, if you're filing a new entity, you just include this in your articles of incorporation. If you're doing an if you're changing an existing entity, which is actually what we did, you actually have to amend your articles of incorporation and possibly rename the company. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Uh, it does require you to state your public benefit. It requires shareholder consent. So you do have to have two thirds of your shareholders consent to this. So if you have a lot of shareholders, um, you'll have to have a vote and you'll have to send out ballots and you'll have to actually have people vote on it which is a good thing. Uh, the nice thing about that, and really the mission drift protecting part of that is that two thirds of the shareholders actually have to uh, vote to stop you from being a PDC, to, to cancel the conversion, which is a good thing. Um, so in Texas, you are required to create a biennial public benefit report. So this is a little different from other states. The biennial public benefit report is essentially a report to your shareholders that says, this is, this is what we did to accomplish our public benefit. So if my public benefit is supplying shoes for people, then I would have to produce a public benefit report that shows here's how many shoes I produced and this is who they went to and all these things that can show to the shareholders that I actually did what I said I was gonna do. Now in other states, uh, public benefit corporations are bound by uh, third party standards of measurement for the, that public benefit. So it's kind of like how we have gap in accounting. Um, gap kind of is a third party standard by which we run our books. Uh, the same thing is true in public benefit statements. So there's third parties that create standards for these and you can, and it's so new that there's not actually just one that you have to choose uh, like there is in accounting. You can choose whatever you want, you just have to state it. Now in Texas, you don't have to do that. Texas, the directors of a corporation are actually eligible to choose whatever they want to have their public benefit report based on. And however they want to measure it, they can do that. They just have to state it somehow and, this, and the shareholders have to know about it. A couple things also on public benefit uh, corporations in Texas is, well, first there's virtually no case law on this. Uh, there haven't been any de decided cases, so. Um, <laughs> I wish I had better news for you than that, but um, a court could come through and just, the, the statute was written so broadly, uh, and that's pretty, that's Texan style right there from a legislative standpoint, is to do it really broadly and give people a lot of freedom to just kind of do whatever they want. And so I think that's really cool, but at the same time, you don't really know how a court is gonna come in and interpret a lot of this. So uh, your mileage may vary, I guess. So in Texas also, a public benefit statement has to be in one of the defined categories in the statute. So you it has to be either an artistic, charitable, cultural, economic, educational, environmental, literary, medical, religious, scientific, or technological. And so that's a big long list and I'm actually pretty sure now that I'm seeing it, you can't see that uh, and that's okay. Uh, get really close, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Conspicuously present there is religious, and that is a really interesting thing to see in Texas because there's only a couple other states that actually did this. The organization that advocates for public benefit corporations does not consider religious purposes to be part of a public benefit, but Texas does. And a couple other states do, and as far as I can tell, uh, Beat and Bow Companies is actually the only religious public benefit corporation in existence. Um, if any of you guys actually run across any in your travels, please uh, email me. That'd be awesome to know about them. But as far as I can tell, we're the only ones so far. Um, and it's actually really challenging to define a religious purpose uh, and a religious public benefit statement. So. Can it be a ah, that's a great question. Yeah, no, it doesn't. It can be a combination of any of these. Um, and really, these are so broad that you can kind of come up with anything you want. Um, and that was kind of the intent of the Texas legislature was uh, let's, let's figure out how to give people the ability to do this and, and not restrict it in any way. So kind of neat. Uh, technological is kind of an interesting one actually. Uh, Kickstarter is a technological PBC. Uh, it's, 
yeah, I don't know. They seem to do a good job though, so. So let's, let's talk about us. Let's talk about Beat and Bow Company's PBC. If you're wondering, uh, normally an, a corporation has to put ink on the end, right? You have to notify people, and that's so that people know that you're a corporation. Um, in, a, in the PBC world in Texas, you have to notify everybody that you're a, a public benefit corporation, you're, especially your shareholders. So you have to actually print it on your uh, stock certificates if you have them. If you remember where those are, you have to print it on there. Uh, yeah, I know, I <laughs> get a couple of chuckles on that one. Um, we chose to put it in our name. It's not strictly required, but uh, highly, 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 highly recommend it. I've analyzed the whole statute. I don't think there's a better way to actually do this uh, other than to put it in your name, just PBC on the end of it. It's a little confusing, but uh, one of the really cool things about that too is that it actually gives you an opportunity to have a conversation about it with people who are like, huh, PBC? Uh, yeah, businesses can exist for purposes beyond profit. Did you know that? Uh, so yeah, our own purpose is to reveal God and his kingdom through our work in the marketplace. That's our company purpose statement. And so uh, historically speaking, we've had that purpose uh, or some version of it for the last 26 years. And so we've always existed for this. Uh, we've always had a large amount of giving. We've always invested uh, huge amounts of money in our employees. We've sent them to all kinds of crazy, we, we send our employees on uh, mission trips every year. Uh, we pay for them and their whole family to do that. That makes no business pr or profit sense whatsoever. Um, but it's part of our purpose. And so we are gonna keep doing it. And uh, yeah, courts don't really like that a uh, profitable corporation is religious. I don't know that, that that's probably not any secret, right? Uh, they, they, the last few years have been much better in that regard. I think the Hobby Lobby case is probably the first one recently where um, the courts have actually held that a for-profit entity selling a secular product can have a religious identity. Um, but in most cases, they've been pretty hostile to it. Uh, there's a lot of cases over the years, we've done a lot of research on this, where um, corporations haven't really been held to have any religious freedom whatsoever. And so uh, we were kind of concerned about that. And so we have all these things that we're doing and uh, we're, we have this religious identity we want to protect. And then there's this other problem is that we are an ESOP. I think Walter mentioned this before, an employee stock ownership plan. We are actually owned by our, our employees. And so what if an employee, uh, you know, decided they wanted to come along and, and sue us for, to stop us from doing it? I mean, Rick and Ron did this back in 98. Uh, the Beatonbow family does not actually have majority ownership of the company anymore. Majority ownership of the company is held by the employees. And so, uh, which, si interesting side note, corporate governance in an ESOP is a really, 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 really fascinating thing when your employees own the company. I'm not gonna get into that, but uh, the shareholder of record is actually a trust. It's the ESOP trust, and we have a trustee. Like any trust, uh, the assets of the trust are all the shares in the company. It's held in for the benefit of the participants, which are the employees. Uh, so it's really interesting. The trustee is not an employee. They don't necessarily share our religious purpose. And so, yeah, that's kind of a problem when you're trying to maintain this religious identity. You're trying to do all these things, and yet you have a trustee that could come in and sue you at any moment if they decided they didn't like what you're doing. How do we do that? Um, well, actually, the answer is public benefit corporation. And, and actually, uh, really, we just kind of had to deal with that up until September 1st of last year. Uh, we just yeah, I guess the trustee could decide that they're not happy with what we're doing and they could come in and sue us and stop us from doing it. That's, that was just a reality of, of our business. So we undertook a conversion earlier this year. Uh, we amended our articles of incorporation. You have to actually say, I elect to be a public benefit corporation. That's a required bit of language in there. We found that out, that's actually not, it's stated, it's buried in the statute, um, but the Secretary of State takes that very seriously. Uh, and now we have this really cool protection, this layer of protection for our directors and officers and senior leadership in how we go about uh, fulfilling this religious purpose in our business. We're very protected in it. We don't have to worry about uh, the trustee coming in and putting a stop to it. We don't have to worry about a, an ex disgruntled employee coming in and saying, well, I actually own shares in the company, so I'm gonna sue you and because you are not doing things that are necessarily profitable by a worldly standard, even though actually uh, all of us would maintain that all the things we do actually cause us to generate more profit is just very indirect, it's a very spiritual thing instead of 
uh, a direct like we can follow it all the way through the financial statement to the bottom line. So, um, yeah, and like I said before, we're possibly the first public religious public benefit corporation, period, which is kind of a cool thing. So, yeah. Any questions about public benefit corporations? <coughs> Take a few until Mike takes the microphone away. So. <laughs> So the statute's, again, purposely vague. Um, it seems like you do need to put it on everything. You need to give notice. One of the ways you can do that is you can still keep ink in your name and say a public benefit corporation underneath. That's another option. The, the intent of the statute is people need to know it. And so it needs to be listed, they, they say conspicuously, that's the legal term, um, but wherever people interact with you, they need to know it. So. It is different, yep. Yeah, that's a. You can do whatever you want, and that's a really cool thing, right? Because you're, I mean, legally you're still a C corp or an S corp or whatever you chose to be. Um, you, legally, the, the corporate status still applies, and you're not a nonprofit. Nope, doesn't change your tax status at all. So, uh, for example, uh, Beaten Bow Company's PBC is actually an S corp, um, but you can be a C corp too, or whatever you want, that's really, and from the state of Texas standpoint, there's, there's no, no such thing as a tax status. You're either a corporation or you're not. So in a, in a normal PBC, uh, you still get to write off, uh, if you give money to a 501c3, and that's part of your public benefit. If, so if you're fulfilling your public benefit by giving money to a nonprofit, then that is a, still a write-off, but if we do it within, within the company, it's not a write-off. You're just, that's a business expense. Um, funny thing about Beaten Bow Company is as an ESOP, all of, and an S-Corp ESOP, so this is, this is fun. I'll, we're an S-Corp ESOP. All of our shares are held in a ESOP trust, which is actually a qualified uh, 401A retirement plan by the IRS. Means that all of our income passes through to the plan. We don't actually pay taxes. Yeah. Anyone want to be an ESOP? <laughs> Any other questions? That's a good question. Yep, still got to pay taxes. Yeah, PBC doesn't get you out of that. So, and ESOP actually only defers you on taxes; doesn't necessarily get you out of it. So, we got press on. Yeah. Thank you.